Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. And as promised, I'm going to begin today uh, reviewing and refuting the book, The Parousia of the Son of Man by Sam Frost. Now, a little bit of background. Sam Frost was at one time a full preterist. Uh, he has since abandoned that truth and promotes himself really as the definitive answer uh, for refuting covenant eschatology, i.e. full preterism. Uh, he wrote a book entitled, Why I Left Full Preterism. It's absolutely awful, I would say. And just recently, uh, and this book is, um, this book was published uh, in 2018, just last year. And this is Mr. Frost, um, should we call it his magnum opus to this date, in his attempt to refute covenant eschatology. And so what I'm going to be doing over the next little bit is I'm going to be uh, addressing some of the claims that he makes, and I'm going to show you how Mr. Frost has, for all practical purposes, abandoned all analytical thought. Now, I'm not trying to be harsh or critical here, but uh, Mr. Frost attempts to use that term, to engage in exegesis, to engage in argumentation, uh, exposes incredible logical fallacies, abuse of exegesis, abuse of hermeneutic, the, the presuppositional approach to eschatology that just simply says uh, it's future and I don't care what you say, it's future. And it's really, really quite a sad uh, thing to witness, uh, I engage with Mr. Frost on fo Facebook on a very, very regular basis. And what is perhaps the most sad of all is that Mr. Frost now feels like he, he could just tell blatant untruths, which he has done concerning me. When he has been confronted about telling those blatant untruths, he refuses to apologize, he refuses to correct. And he just proceeds. And then he engages in really just nothing but insults, uh, demeaning insults of those who believe in covenant eschatology. He says we are ignorant. He says we are stupid. He uses all sorts of epitaphs to describe us, those of us who believe that the Lord kept his word and came in A.D. 70. Okay, so we begin today with what is obviously to Mr. Frost an absolutely critical foundational issue, and that is the Greek word parousia. I mean, after all, the title of the book is The Parousia of the Son of Man. And he begins with defining the word. Now, I'm going to, this is on page three of the book, and he says, here is, and he gives an example from 2 Corinthians chapter 10 to verse 10. Here is simply the presence of the body, which really brings out the meaning of the term parousia. It is a bodily presence, an arrival of somebody that is present and accounted for. Now, if you allow Mr. Frost to define parousia in that narrowly defined way, then guess what? He might have a case. But Mr. Frost is not quite forthcoming here. What Mr. Frost does not tell you in this book is that parousia is not limited in its definition to a bodily presence of someone. And by the way, he sort of kind of gives the farm away in the very first paragraph when he said, Thus, a parousia of a person is their arrival, their presence, notice this, in whatever company or form. Let me read that again. A parousia of a person is their arrival, their presence, in whatever company or form. Well, wait a minute. Then he tries to tell us that a parousia is a bodily 
presence. It can't be different forms. So you see, on in the very first page, Mr. Frost is not quite forthcoming. He doesn't share with his readers that parousia has a wider definition from simply a bodily presence. Now, I've copied off several references here that I just want to share with you. The very first reference is from Colin Brown from the New International Dictionary of the New Testament, Volume 2, printed by Z Zondervan, 1986, page 90, 935 and following. Now, Mr. Brown is recognized as a world-class scholar. In addition to pointing out that parousia can mean, okay, nobody's denying that, can mean a bodily presence, just like 2 Corinthians 10.10. 10. Okay. But Mr. Brown also points out that parousia is a term, quote, used to speak of the arrival of a dignitary, and yet Mr. Sam Frost himself in an in a article that I have, noted that, quote, it can also speak of the arrival of the gods invisibly, though with visible effects, in space and time, unquote. Do you catch the power of that? Mr. Frost himself is on record, not here, not in his book, but he is on record as admitting that a parousia can be an invisible presence of the gods or God, but with visible manifestation in time and space. Well, hey, I agree with that. By the way, Adolf Deisman, in a groundbreaking work, you know, uh, it was another reprint of the book was in 1978, on, on page 378 and following, has a discussion of the, of the Greek word parousia, and he says, we were able to trace the word parousia in the East as a technical expression for the arrival of the visit of the king or an emperor. Unquote. Amen. However, Mr. Diceman goes ahead to say later on in the book that when a king or an em emperor sent his ambassador sent his representative, that was considered to be his parousia. We, would, we might call that a representative identity because the emperor or the king sends his man, sends his representative. And when that representative came, it was considered the emperor himself coming. Do you see a train coming here? And does Mr. Frost share that with you in his book? No, he does not. Now what's interesting is that the scholars, including some of the finest scholars in the world, the lexicons, the Bible dictionaries, as I've already taken note of with Colin Brown, tell us that Josephus, now who in the world is Josephus? Well, guess what? He was a contemporary of Paul. And Kittle's Theological Dictionary, volume 5, page 864 and following, says that Josephus, in his book, Antiquities of the Jews, book 3, book 9, book 18, okay, used the Greek word parousia to refer to God's presence in the Old Testament when God judged nation. Now, if you remember the series that we did on Matthew 24, 3, when the disciples about asked about Christ's parousia, I shared with you passage after passage after passage from the Old Testament in which God would use this nation to judge this nation representative identity. Yet in each one of those instances in which Yahweh used this nation to judge this nation, it was said that Yahweh came. 
He came on the clouds. He came with a shout. He came in flaming fire. Now, the Greek word that is used in the Septuagint in those passages is prosopon, which means face. Literally, it means nose. <laughs> okay? But it denotes the same kind of thought. They're not synonyms per se. They're not the same word. Prosopon and parousia clearly communicate the same idea. And so here we have Kittle's Theological Dictionary, widely considered as one of the most comprehensive uh, Bible dictionaries available, telling us that Josephus, first century historian, contemporary with Paul, used parousia to refer to something other than, let's see, a bodily presence that Mr. Frost wants you to believe is basically the only definition. Furthermore, J.N.D. Kelly, a, a very, very noted church historian, in his book on the epistles of Peter and Jude, shows how Josephus, again, uses parousia to speak of the manifestations of God's majesty. And then in an absolutely remarkable, I'm telling you, uh, and this is in one of the references that Kelly uh, gives us, uh, Josephus tells of, the, tells of the story during the reign of Caligula. Now, Caligula demanded that a statue of himself be erected in the temple at Jerusalem. Well, the Jews were on the verge of revolt. They approached Petronius, a governor of Syria, and implored him to approach the emperor not to do this great thing and to warn that if it was done, revolt and war would ensue. Now, I can't, I can't read the entire thing, but in, in the Antiquities chapter 8, 6 and following, we find the following. Petronius appealed to the Jews not to revolt, and then Josephus records this, quote, And now God did show his presence, parousia, to Petronius. Well, you see, Mr. Frost would have us to believe that parousia is a, quote, bodily presence, unquote, or an arrival of somebody that is present and accounted for, unquote. Did God, did Yahweh manifest himself in a bodily presence to Petronius? Well, if so, Petronius was the very first person in history to see God in bodily form. But he continues, how did God make his parousia known? Quote, God sent down a great shower of rain, contrary to human expectation, for that day was a clear day and gave no sign by the appearance of the sky of any rain. No, the whole year had been subject to a great drought and made men despair of any water from above, unquote. So, according to Josephus, when God manifested his presence by bringing a un totally unexpected rain shower, that was his parousia. Did Mr. Frost share any of this with you? No, he did not. And now a final example. Fascinating story from 2 Mac Maccabees chapter 8. This is the story of, of Judas, Judas Maccabeus, defeating the forces of Nicanor. Nicanor was a general in the army of Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, Nicanor had 20,000 troops and Judas had somewhere around six to, to 8,000 men. 6,000 generally believed. But Judas approached his men, vastly outnumbered, three times outnumbered. And he said to them that they should be strong, they should strengthen their hearts. And he said to them, quote, God will help us and will personally lead the attack against Nicanor. Unquote. Do you suppose that Nicanor, excuse me, Judas believed for even a moment that God was going to bodily, visibly come down out of heaven and lead the attack against Nicanor? No, you know he didn't. But that very day, 
the Maccabees said, quote, Almighty God fought on their side, and they killed more than 9,000 of the enemy. They put the enemy to flight. God personally fought for them, not bodily, not bodily and not visibly. And thus, what we have in Mr. Frost's opening salvo, as it were, is his attempt to convince you that the Greek word parousia has one definition, although he very subtly has to admit that it may include, quote, whatever form, unquote. Well, indeed. And what does the Bible have to say about the coming of the Lord? His parousia. The Son of Man will come in the glory of the Father. Well, what does that mean? It means he was going to come as the Father had come. Well, let's see. Josephus, the Maccabees, the scholars, the dictionaries all agree God had come in the Old Testament, and that's what Jesus was referring to, but never in bodily form. So Jesus said his parousia was to be in the same form, to use that term, as the Father had come in the Old Testament. But in the Old Testament, God had never come literally, visibly, in bodily, in bodily form. Therefore, Jesus' parousia was not to be in a, quote, bodily form. Now, was it to be manifested in space and time? Absolutely. The fall of Jerusalem was to be the visible manifestation of the presence of Jesus, his parousia. It was to prove he is enthroned in the heavens as King of kings and Lord of lords. He was not coming as a five foot five Jewish man out of heaven. He was coming in the glory of the Father as the Father had come. And thus, Mr. Frost's opening presupposition that he hopes you will accept without question, perhaps without further study and investigation. You know, if you grant a man his presuppositions, he can prove anything that he wants to. You prove that his presupposition is wrong and false, and the whole house of cards comes tumbling down. I have shown you from the scholars, from contemporary sources of Paul, I have shown you in earlier videos that the coming of God, and Jesus said he was coming in that form, in that manner, was never a literal, visible, bodily coming. And thus, Mr. Frost's very first presupposition is false. We will continue our examination of Mr. Frost's claims in regard to the parousia of the Son of Man. Listen, you have a fantastic weekend. Please be safe. Lord willing, we'll see you on Monday.